Minnesota is a beautiful state with a lot of open space. If you are stranded in your car on the side of a secluded road in the middle of the night, you might think twice about trying to hoof it for help. But Brandon Swanson, a 19-year-old college student, thought he would give it a try. It wasn't as reckless as it sounds. He grew up around there, and he was on the phone with his parents the whole time, making sure they knew where he was headed so they could pick him up. Then something strange happened. In the middle of the conversation, Brandon cried out in alarm. Then he went silent. He was never seen or heard from again. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. I'm Chris. And Tuesday, May 13th, 2008 signaled the end of the semester at Minnesota West Community and Technical College. Brandon had just graduated high school in 2007 and didn't feel like enrolling in a four-year program. Instead, he chose to study wind turbines for a year at the campus in Canby, Minnesota. He grew up in Marshall, Minnesota, about a 36-mile or 40-minute drive from the college. It was an easy drive, too, as Brandon only had to head southeast on the highway to reach his parents' house. No back roads, no confusing exits, no doubling back, nothing. It was a drive he made often and a route he knew well. With school out for the summer, Brandon decided to go out and celebrate with his classmates. The evening began in Lind, Minnesota, a small town about eight miles southwest of his home in Marshall. From there, Brandon doubled back to Canby to hit a different party. He hung around until about midnight, then said goodbye to his friends, got in his car, and headed home. While on his way home, Brandon got his Chevy Lumina stuck in a ditch. He tried calling his friends for help, but no one picked up their phones. Around 1.54 a.m., he called his parents, told them what had happened, and asked if they could pick him up. He was fine, no injuries, but he couldn't get the car out. Annette and Brian Swanson hit the road, and Brian stayed on the phone with his son as they drove. Brandon believed he was midway between Lind and Marshall, about a 10-minute drive from his parents' house. Based on his directions, Brian thought he had a pretty good idea where his son was. Assuming Brandon's information was accurate, the most likely location was a spot where the highway dips down into a shallow ditch. But when Brian and Annette arrived on the scene, there was no sign of Brandon or his car. For miles around, it's nothing but flat terrain. They figured he was close by, so they started flashing their lights and honking their horns, and surely their son would see or hear them. But he told them he couldn't see them. He stayed on the line with his father and started flashing his own headlights, but Brian and Annette never saw his lights either. Little did they know they were in the wrong spot. Brandon was convinced his parents were in the wrong location, not that he'd given them the wrong directions. He grew frustrated and eventually decided to change gears. He said there were lights in the distance, which made him think he was closer to the town of Lind. So he told his father to meet him in the parking lot of a bar in town. Brandon headed towards the lights on foot. Brian turned around and dropped a net off at home, staying on the phone with his son the entire time. Brandon narrated his journey while his father drove back into town. It would take his son much longer to walk to their meeting spot, so Brian sat and waited. Meanwhile, Brandon talked about walking along a gravel road and that he was taking a shortcut through a field. He mentioned hearing running water nearby and complained about fences several times. The only guide he had was the light coming from Lind, or what he thought was Lind. Around 2.30 or 3 a.m., while he was on the phone with his dad, Brandon said something about a fence, then yelled, Oh, shit. The call ended abruptly, so Brian called him back, but Brandon never answered again. Those were the last two words anyone heard Brandon speak. They tried calling him back over and over with no answer. His phone was working. He just wasn't picking up. Eventually, a day or two later, all calls went straight to voicemail, meaning the phone was off. And whether someone powered it down or it ran out of battery or broke is a mystery. Worried, Brian went back for his wife. And with a few of Brandon's friends, they searched up and down every street in Lind looking for their lost son. Hours went by, more than enough time for Brandon to surface somewhere. But he never showed up at the parking lot where he had originally told his dad to meet him. The sun rose without a word or sign from Brandon. Officially out of options, Brian and Annette reported him missing to the Lind police. But the cops in Lind weren't pouncing at the story. Your 19-year-old son didn't come home after a college party? Doesn't sound like an emergency. 
One cop told Annette that Brandon had the right to be missing. But the events between 1.54 and 6.30 a.m. were enough to raise concern. How many drunk college kids call their parents, ask for help, scream, oh shit, then never answer their phone again? Almost 12 hours after anyone heard from him, Lind police sent a search party looking for Brandon. They assumed they'd find him hung over on the side of the road or at a friend's house nearby. But those assumptions were quickly snuffed out. Once they couldn't find Brandon or his car in town, Lind police called the county sheriff's office to pull whatever strings they could. They got his cell phone records to see where he was calling from while he was on the phone with his dad. What they discovered added a bizarre twist to the case. According to his cell phone records, Brandon was nowhere near where he thought he was. He was at least 20 miles from Lind. Sure enough, sheriff's deputies found Brandon's car abandoned on a side street about a mile north of the highway, not far from the Yellow Medicine River, which runs parallel along that stretch of highway. Brandon's car was hung up on an incline on the road's edge. The vehicle wasn't damaged, but the tires were off the ground on one side. The keys were missing, but his glasses were found inside. And that's especially strange because he was blind in one eye and couldn't see without them. But for some reason, Brandon left them behind. Where he went from there is a mystery. The car was surrounded by grass and gravel, so there was no way to tell which direction he walked in. Now, here's where things don't add up. Brandon left the party in Canby shortly after midnight. Assuming he got in his car and drove off right away, he'd reach the area where his car was found outside a town called Taunton 15 minutes later. That's the halfway point between the party in Canby and his house in Marshall. So what happened between midnight and the time Brandon made calls to his friends and then his parents? Why did it take him over an hour to drive 13 miles from Canby to Taunton? Furthermore, why didn't he know where he was? If he left the party in Canby, he'd have no reason to drive anywhere near Lind, especially not near the halfway point he told his father about. From Canby, he'd have to go entirely out of his way down a different highway, then take several back roads to get between Lind and Marshall. This brings us to the question of why Brandon wasn't on Highway 68, which is a literal straight line between Canby and his parents' house. We all know what college kids like to do at college parties. Drink. Witnesses at the party said Brandon had one shot of booze and didn't seem drunk when he left. His parents also backed that story up, saying Brandon sounded pretty coherent while on the phone. The only reason one might stay off the main roads is to avoid police. While Brandon was under age, a single shot wouldn't impair a 19-year-old man, at least not enough to warrant a stop. In 2008, the police didn't care about the why. All that mattered was the where. They refocused their search around the Taunton area using a helicopter and a team of trained bloodhounds. The helicopter looked for Brandon in the open fields while the dogs followed his scent trail for almost three miles. According to the dog's nose, he walked past several fields before turning west by northwest towards an abandoned farm. But the dogs kept moving past the farm and followed a trail along the Yellow Medicine River. The dog's response indicated that Brandon entered the river at one particular spot. Along this stretch of river, the water could be knee-high or 15 feet deep. It doesn't mean he drowned, but it's not impossible. To be sure, boat teams deployed on the river to search for his body, but they all came up empty. The sheriff didn't buy into the drowning theory either, saying Brandon's body would have washed up if he fell in. They walked up and down the river for 30 days without any sign of Brandon. But the police knew they were looking in the right place. Brandon mentioned running water while on the phone with his dad, and the bloodhounds following his scent down the river lined up with that story. It's unclear if the dogs picked his scent back up after the river. According to Annette, one of the dogs jumped in the river, jumped back out, and followed the scent up to a different gravel road. And she believes Brandon crossed the river and kept moving. The official search ended, but that didn't stop Brandon's parents and 100 volunteers from combing the area between Taunton and Porter, the next town before Canby. Some rode out on ATVs, while others took horses to cover more ground. Still, nobody turned up any sign of Brandon or his things, not even a footprint. The summer came and went, and large-scale search efforts resumed in the fall once the farmers had plowed their fields. This time, police brought cadaver dogs to help locate his presumably dead body. 
They caught the scent of human remains northwest of Porter, but it wasn't Brandon. By now, teams had searched 122 square miles between Canby and Marshall. They followed 90 different leads about Brandon, but none returned any meaningful results. Fall turned to winter, and snowstorms and frigid temperatures made the search impossible. Months turned to years, years into a decade, and as of 2022, nobody has ever seen or heard from Brandon Swanson. And his phone, wallet, car keys, and clothing have never been found. But people still want answers about what happened to Brandon Swanson, and when they don't get answers, they tend to make them up, which leads to wild theories circulating around the internet. Among the most popular is that Brandon did it on purpose. They say he's alive and well somewhere in the world. But people who vanish on purpose are usually running away from something. And Brandon, as far as anybody knows, didn't have anything to run from. He didn't have issues at school or home, and he wasn't in any legal trouble. He even had plans to transfer to an Iowa university to continue his studies. Besides, if you were to stage your own disappearance, why would you call your parents and lead them on a wild goose chase at 2 a.m.? Others think Brandon was struck and killed by a car while walking down the dark side streets, but that theory doesn't hold much water for several reasons. One, he was on the phone with his dad when he said, oh shit, Brian would have heard the car coming. Haven't you ever been talking on the phone with someone when a car drove by? It's loud, isn't it? Besides, Brandon said he was taking a shortcut when he muttered his last words. He was nowhere near a road. Could a Minnesota Night Stalker have killed Brandon? It's not impossible, but improbable. A deranged killer would have had to be in the right place at the right time to find him meandering through the fields, and police never found any evidence of foul play. This also rules out any wild animal attacks, as they would have discovered his remains if a bear or wildcat attacked him. In another scenario, Brandon died in a tragic accident. He could have fallen into the water or down a deep hole. And still another theory holds that somebody isn't telling the truth in Brandon's story. Perhaps a group of underage college kids were afraid to get in trouble and lied about how much he drank that night. Maybe they lied about when Brandon left the party or who he left the party with. Where was he for those hours before he got his car stuck and called his parents? Did something happen in Canby that Brandon felt he needed to run from? His mother never forgot what the police said to her when she first reported Brandon missing. He has the right to be missing. She believed if they acted immediately and pulled his cell phone records quicker, they could have saved the time they wasted in Lind. They might have found Brandon alive. Annette met with her local representative to propose a new law about how police handle missing persons. At the time, missing adults weren't treated the same as missing children, and while she knew changing it wouldn't help Brandon's case, it might spare another mother from this terrible experience. The bill was called Brandon's Law. They hoped to change the way Minnesota's existing missing child law was worded. In short, Brandon's Law would change the word child to person. There were a few concerns about privacy among local police forces, and they questioned when they could ping someone's phone and when they couldn't. And while the words, he has the right to be missing, sound pretty harsh, especially to a worried mother, the officer wasn't totally wrong. Brandon's law was officially signed into law in May 2009. His family and friends have never given up hope that they may find answers, but as of 2022, no trace of him has been found. What do you think happened to Brandon Swanson? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.